don't know South Shion. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So if you don't know, hi, um, I'm South Shion. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's the managing director of the digital technology unit in um, Singapore Palace. He was formerly in PayPal and. He has led numerous technology team in HP, Garena, Yahoo. So he's the right person to you know to get in touch. You know, even after this uh, presentation, you know, meet him. Uh, you know, have coffee. You know, um, take this uh, session forward. So yeah, so Sasha, I'll just pass the mic to you, and you can probably do a better introduction than me. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure. I think you did a good job. <laughs> um, hi everyone. My name is Sasha. Um, now that I look at it, I'm not quite sure whether it is too cartoony uh, in the picture, but uh, I was looking at um, talking about technology teams, and the first thing that comes to mind is like, hey, pointy hair manager, so there it goes. Um, so the subtitle is, or what does my manager actually do? Um, this is my, I think, one of my very few or possibly my only ever talk that I've done that is not technical. So. <laughs> And this is the first time I'm doing this kind of talk anyway, so bear with me if I kind of get a bit rambly because I get uncomfortable when I can't show code, so... <laughs> um, yeah. Before I begin, maybe can I get, like, to understand what a crowd is here is like? Because I see a lot of people with uh, long sleeve shirts and, and so... I'm getting kind of nervous now, Because so. you guys could, be, could know this a lot better than I do and then could be embarrassing myself. How many here are uh, engineers? How many here have managed engineering teams? Okay, that's good. That's a good number. There's a lot of people I can smoke, so that's good. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's not actually working. Ah, okay. <coughs> Any, anyone actually still reads Dilbert, actually? Uh, okay, not that many, though. So, yeah. yeah. I'm not getting enough laughter here. <laughs> okay, lame joke. Let's move on. Uh, okay, so let me talk about, about me. Um, my name is Sao Xiong. I have uh, done a number of years of... Uh, managing teams. I've been in the industry for about 21 years and um, managed software engineering teams for about 17. So 10 years in startups. The kind of teams that you manage in startups are quite different. But I've also done seven years in Silicon Valley tech startups. So sort of balance that out over time. Um, so I guess I, I, I know sort of what I'm talking about, I hope. Um, I'm currently in Singapore Power. That's the company that I just joined. Uh, somebody was asking me earlier on, Michael, whether it's a startup. So the answer is no, it's not a startup. It's a utilities company. Um, so all the power that you get in Singapore actually are distributed by Singapore Power. Um, and I just started a new team there about two and a half months ago. Before that, I was in PayPal and then I was also in Yahoo, HP and so on. I started on my career in ID and Singtel. So I sort of have been on the other side as well. Okay. Not being able to click is not good for my nerves. Ah, okay. So, what do engineering managers do? So, for those who are engineering managers, um, what do you do? Anyone want to give a quick shout out? Keep out the way. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Support the team. Okay. Any other things? Hiring. Okay, that sounds. Are you a manager? Okay. How about engineers? What do your managers do? Do you know what your managers do? Facilitators. Facilitators. Okay. Anybody else? Take care of politics. Sorry? Take care of politics. Take care of politics. Okay. Interesting. Um, anyone else want to venture or something? Shield the team from sales. Shield the team from sales. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, on a practical level, what do managers do on a day-to-day -day basis? Clearly communicate priorities. Clearly communicate priorities. That's good. You, know, you sound like you have a lot of corporate experience, actually. 
And that's a, that's a good one. Um, so I have been asked, I, I have been asked um, relatively often, like, what do engineering managers do? So after a while, I actually listed down some of those things. And um, maybe I should stand closer here. Does it work? OK, so I, I listed a, a list of things um, here to talk about what engineering managers do. Um, organization, basically organizing the team, uh, recruitment, hiring people, augmentation. When your team grows a bit too big, what do you do? So you need to augment them, you need to increase the team size, and you can't hire fast enough, what do you do? Um, development, basically developing your people, right? Not just um, hiring them, getting them to do a job, but basically you need to, to develop them into to better engineers. Um, evaluation, at the end of the year or maybe mid-year, you do need to do a performance evaluation. Um, how do you increase the productivity of the engineers? And if they want to leave, what do you do? You lock them up, you know, how, how do you retain them? Um, the kind of culture that you build and um, the, the ones that you nurture, what happens if you, you start from ground up from a empty slate? What kind of culture do you want to build? And what happens if you inherit a team? The team with culture already exists, then, then what do you want to do with that? Uh, does the clip flicker? And finally, of course, if there's conflict, then you, you manage conflict as well. So in terms of uh, some of the things that you talked about earlier on, like um, managing priorities, yeah, productivity, you want to actually increase the efficiency of your engineers. You want to make them more efficient. Um, and a lot of other things that you talk about as well. So in reality is, um, you've notice from the list here, none of them are actually technical work. Right, so does an engineering manager do technical work? What do you think? Should they code? OK. Um, so actually, a lot of engi some engineering managers do code, um, especially for the startups. But reality is these are actually two different roles. So if you are an engineering manager, that's a different role. And if you are also coding, then basically you're playing more than one role. Right? So you might not be as good. So if I look at it, then engineering manager is a role, right? just like any other role that you play. And these are the tasks that you need to do, like, or some of the tasks that you need to do. Obviously, within a talk like this, I, I can't talk about all of them at once. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about, very briefly, the first three things, um, basically about organization, how do you organize a team, how do you recruit, and how do you augment a team. And of course, which level, right? Uh, which level of people are you talking about? The, as a line manager, where engineers actually report to you, uh, you would actually do things a lot different from, say, uh, as a middle manager or even like uh, executive management. Uh, but nonetheless, whatever I, I mentioned just now, in terms of the tasks that needs to be done, these are quite universal. It's just like the level of things that you need to do, right? Um, for example, the, and I will go through some of them, the organization, at the top level, the CTO or the VP of engineering probably needs to decide how he wants to organize the team. But even down at the line management level, you might want to organize the team differently. It's the kind of task still remains, it's just at which level and which level of granularity. Oh, it works now, okay. So, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is recruitment. Um, I spent a lot of time actually, I spent more time actually looking out for pictures on the slides, so hope you guys appreciate it. it uh, do you know what this is? Oh, okay, great. Connoisseur. What do you think this Three Kingdom is? Um, I think it's about trying to get the smarter guy to go to the farm. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly because I'm not really good at pronouncing Mandarin names. Liu Bei, he was trying to uh, convince Zhuge Liang to join him, right? And he visited his house three times. And that is his recruitment, right? In the end, he did recruit uh, Tuka Liang and, uh, and, you know, fame and fortune and ensued, but uh, it's not an easy task. Recruitment is, is never easy. So hiring is, is really a project that you need to consistently uh, work on. It is not something incidental. It's actually a lot of hard work. So some of the basic questions you want to ask yourself, it's like, why? Why do I want to hire? It's like, do I have enough people? 
uh, what's the purpose of the new hires? Uh, which roles do you want to hire? Which roles do you need the most? First, which comes later, or which I do not need at all? Um, how many? The numbers? Am I hiring too many? Am I hiring too little? Um, what are the things that are available for you to help you to hire? Uh, people to help you, resources to help you, uh, organization to help you, what is there available for you? And then what's the strategy? How do you want to strategize your hiring? And what are the processes that you want to implement or are already in, in, in place? Because if you are joining a um, corporate, like what I just did in Singapore Power, then there are times that you can't really define your hiring strategy, neither can you define your hiring processes. Then how do you actually adapt to it or maybe you adapt the processes to yourself? Oops. Just do. Can I go back, please? Ah. Um. Is there another back? I can't remember. Okay. No, sorry. Just go front. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one of the things you need to do is really want to build up a recruitment pipeline, and recruitment pipeline. Um, well, it depends on where it is. For some, it's. I'm just going to get an external recruiter, I'm going to pay him money and he's going to recruit people for me. So the answer is really no. Um, you need more than that. So your recruitment pipeline could be from your network, from your friends, the, uh, your family, even alumni, ex-colleagues and so on. Um, if you have been around, ex-colleagues is, is great because then you have a network of people whom you already work with and you know who are good and who are no good um, and then you can hire accordingly. Um, uh, not no good as in really bad, but maybe not suitable for the role. Uh, from the community, like meetups like this, right? Then you meet people. Uh, maybe you find somebody whom you hit it off well, and then you can work well with. Uh, then you have in recruiters, both external and internal. Uh, in larger corporations, usually you would have like internal recruiters or, or talent acquisition, uh, depending on depending on, on the company itself. Um, and then you also have external recruiters. You could have, you could be working with external recruiters as well. Uh, although I think it, it really depends on the external recruiter. Some are, are, are really good. Some are really technical and really understand your needs. Some are really more like they just want your money. Um, but nonetheless, they are a possible source. And then other stuff like job boards. Um, so posting on things like Job Street and Job ZB still works at a certain level, but I think increasingly they are being replaced by other things like LinkedIn and, and so on. Uh, advertising, I'm not sure anybody actually still advertises today, but I suppose it depends on the different kind of roles that you're looking for. Oh, okay, thank you. Oops. Right, um, guess which picture? Guess who this is? No? This is a bit hard, right? This is Han Sing from uh, the um, pre Han days. No? Yes? No? Okay, never mind. <laughs> way, way too deep. Yeah. Um, anyway, so interview panels, you, you want to set up a team to do interviews. Um, it could be a permanent team, semi-permanent team, if you're looking at short term, or it could be a, a uh, ad hoc team that you could say, look, this, you guys, if we have a recruitment going on, then I'll randomly pick from any one of, the, of you. Why do you want to do that? Because you really want to prep up your interviewers. You really want to brief them what you want to, to hire. And, and all those questions we asked about earlier on, you need to actually talk to them. You need to actually let your, let your team know or the interview panel know who you are, uh, what kind of people you're trying to hire. And of course, there will be processes and, and so on. Um, number of rounds that you want to run, and not just engineers alone, because I think that's tempting sometimes. Okay, let's just get engineers to interview. But you want to actually get different perspectives. Say, let's say you want to hire an uh, engineer. Do you want to get your product people in to sit in, uh, right, to really see whether he's suitable to, to be part of the team as well? Uh, so that's interviewing. And these are some of the people that you probably work with. As a, um, from this side, if you are the manager, then you are the hiring manager, then you need to get, get interviewers. Um, you would have internal recruiters to help you. 
then external recruiters will should work on both sides. So uh, of course, most of the time they are paid by you, but nonetheless, good external recruiters should actually be working for both sides and then as a the candidate. Um, one very important thing is that as a person or as an organization <coughs> that who is recruiting people, you need to be, I think you need to be a bit more aware about candidates because candidates who come in for interviews, um, they are people too, so you really need to treat them to have uh, a good candidate experience because not only it affects your recruitment, it also affects the branding of a company. As a candidate who comes in and he has a very bad uh, candidate experience, it will only show up badly for your branding of a company. So whatever it is, you should try to uh, have good like, interview experience um, and good recruitment experience. Even if you do not hire that person in the end, you should strive to have the best recruitment experience possible. Okay, so strategies for hiring actually differs. So you don't have like um, um, sort of one strategy fits all, one size fits all kind of strategy. Normally for different levels, you have different things. So if you are talking about interns, sometimes you, you probably want to do like university liaisons, have some people closer to the, the university. Recent grads, then there'll be other things. You want to do coding tests maybe, you want to do some competition hackathons. Uh, someone junior, maybe again more coding tests, uh, referrals, mid-level, then you probably want to do away with the coding tests because you find it hard for, for mid-level or senior people to actually agree to doing your coding tests. Um, and for senior people, executive recruiters actually work pretty well you know, because they have the reach and um, they know uh, people at a different level. So they're actually pretty good. But if you look at it, all, overall, I think referrals is probably the best. And, and for me, in my experience, is that uh, I usually get the, the best people through referrals, people who, ref who knows people um, because they have worked with them before and they think that uh, these are the people who you should be working with. And that works especially well with your internal folks. So you have engineers, you should let them try to pick the people they work with um, because then it actually do well be for, do better for a more um, cohesive team, right? You have a team of people who, who work well together. Right, so that's for recruitment. Um, let's talk a little bit about organization, how you organize a team. Yeah. Familiar? No? Yes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I spent too much time on getting the pictures. You know. uh, so organization, they, in, an organ, in an engineering team, they are, and also like the, the ad, adjacent teams, there are lots of different types of people. Uh, so you need to know what kind of team that you're trying to build. Right? And I'm talking about building here is not about um, recruitment. It's really about how do I assemble the team together. Right? What kind of roles do I need and how do I structure the team? So if you look here, there are diff lots of different types of engineers. Um, and on an adjacent level, you have like team leads, uh, uh, project managers, architects, engineering managers, and so on and so forth. So there, there are lots of people that you, you need to work with. So how do you put them together? Oops. Right, so you have assembled your team. Um, quite incidental, actually, the Avengers, but... Uh, uh, so you have assembled team. So how, how do you actually put these, two, these people together? Who should be the ones going to the team, right? Um, so the first thing is, really, the, the Scrum team you assemble depends on what you want to deliver. If you're delivering a mobile app, then you really want to have more mobile engineers in that team. But at the same time, you don't want just all mobile engineers because mobile apps usually don't just work on their own, right? So you need some back-end systems as well. But you want to get like front-end engineers who does CSS and HTML, maybe not so suitable for like a mobile uh, app team. Um, but at, a, at the same time, as you assemble a team, everyone needs to have a role. You should not assemble a team where you have people in there, then you ask him or her, so what part do you play in this team? And he or she doesn't have a role. That's, that's really bad. Um, and the skills should be complementary. So again, if you have a team of very high level people or very um, junior people, then you should be wary as well. You should always have a good mix uh, of teams, um, skills as well as levels. And not everyone needs to be a rock star. 
And finally, of course, um, you need to have a team that can work together. Right? Um, you can always start with a team who can already work together, or you try to get them to be more cohesive and then, and then work your way towards. Right? Um, don't end up in this case. Yeah. Right, so um, next thing, functional versus delivery. So talking about functional teams versus delivery teams, how do you organize the teams? Um, functional teams really are very, very common in, in most organizations. And it's a very natural thing to do because most of the time, an organization, a company, is organized around functions. Like you have marketing as a team, you have uh, finance as a team, you have HR as a team, you have sales as a team. So very naturally, it's coming down to engineering. Hey, let's organize people as QA people. These are your, all your mobile engineers. These are your web engineers, your API engineers, and so on and so forth. Um, it is not entirely wrong, but as you know, you deliver in scrum teams. You don't really work this way, right? So what you really want to do is to deliver in uh, delivery teams. And then you mix and match people accordingly to deliver the products that you want. Then again, this is not the perfect thing either because you just can't have delivery teams because if you have delivery teams only, then it will be very, um, there will be a lot of duplications. People will be repeating things that have been done by somebody else. You're always re reinventing the wheel. Um, so ideally, what you have is really a kind of hybrid team where you have delivery teams as well as uh, functional teams. Right? And that's what most people actually gravitate towards. Now, some of these things sound very uh, commonsensical to you, and, and they are, but trust me, there are actually a lot of people who end up like um, just having these teams alone because, hey, you know, this is what Scrum teams are all about. Uh, this is what Agile is all about. And, or they end up with this because this is very functional. It's very convenient for me to assemble a team of all mobile engineers and let them, let them run, right? Uh, but nonetheless, if you want to if you want to have a, a well-balanced team, then you should try to aim towards this kind of structure. Okay, um, of course, that's from one perspective. I think different companies have actually gone through uh, uh, or have tried different things. And one of the more interesting things that I've seen a company try is uh, uh, by Spotify. I'm not sure any one of you know how Spotify organizes their teams. So it's pretty interesting, um, and I think there are some companies in Singapore who actually uh, model after this, this particular model. You, what Spotify has is, in the verticals, these are what they call the squads, and the squads are basically scrum teams. And you have groups of squads under a tribe, and tribe is a uh, group of scrum teams that work for a particular purpose uh, or particular product. Right? But beyond that, they have something called chapters. Um, chapters will unite, say, let's say these are all front-end engineers. So you have a chapter of front-end engineers here, a chapter of mobile engineers here. Right? And then you have different tribes. But the, um, in this case, you will also have duplications because let's say you have front-end engineers here and you have front-end engineers here. How does that work? Then you will have something called guilds. Or rather, not you, they, they will have something called guilds. So this is an interesting model. Um, I seen another company in, I talked to somebody in another company who was actually modeling something on this. It's quite interesting. In fact, I've tried something like this in PayPal as well. And it actually works pretty well. I was, I was trying it out and uh, it actually works pretty well. It does get people much more excited. Even as you're working in Scrum teams, you will cut across the Scrum teams and get them to be uh, trying out or sharing information about what they have done within that Scrum team. Because at the engineering manager level sometimes, because you have a lot of information, right? Because you get information from every one of your scrum teams or a number, or maybe a two or three scrum teams, and you know all these things. But you'd be surprised at the scrum team level, they sometimes do not know what the other teams are doing. In fact, often they don't know what the other teams are doing. So you do this kind of sharing, it actually enriches everybody. And um, if you're, you're running multiple Scrum teams, I would, I would say, I would encourage maybe you want to try something like this. Maybe not at that level where Spotify is doing, like even calling the, the Scrum team squads and, and so on, and tribes and so on, but really um, try like a, uh, something that cuts across the different Scrum teams. 
Right, so that's for organization. And, uh, oh, oh, sorry, that's for uh, talking about special organization. I'll talk a little bit about job levels and, and, and families. Um, and these are quite common things because if you're a startup and you come in and you start out and say, hey, I hire engineers. An engineer, an engineer, it's an engineer. But then everyone has on their own their desire to advance, right? They want to progress, they want to become better. How do they become better? Um, by, in many companies, uh, this is what they do going by job levels. So you start off, let's say, software engineer one, go up to two, senior software engineer, and so on and so forth. Climb, climbing up the ladder. Um, if you've been around, it might seem like, hey, you know, that seems very corporate, that seems very true. But we are human beings, there is always a desire to be able to advance. You want to know how well you have done, right? So you, if you're running a startup and you have an engineering team, do watch out for this because people want to know whether they have improved, they've become better. And they do want to know whether they can, they are, they are being promoted, uh, if they've done something well or if they want to be promoted, how do I actually get about being promoted? So you do really need to think about what does it mean for you to get from software engineer one to engineer two, to be senior software engineer, to be principal software engineer, and so on and so forth. Uh, for smaller teams, maybe it might matter less, but as the team size grows, then there will always be comparisons like, is he better than me? How am I compared to him? And if he's better than me, then how do I get to be like him? Right? And so on and so forth. So this um, progression, job levels, um, and job family as well, it's sometimes tempting to say, look, this is like um, engineering, I don't care about anything else. But if you try to organize things a little bit, then you, you should try to say uh, other kinds of roles, maybe say a design role, you might have the same ladder as well. Because in that case, you would want to match one with one as well. Yeah. And that sort of gives a sense of organization to the team. Right? Uh, right, so something to describe it. Job levels are important. Um, give you estimation as an individual where you are. Uh, tells you where you're heading as well. So sometimes job levels depend on years of experience. Sometimes you see people actually measure by, hey, but he's younger than me. Why is his job level higher than me? Then there will be some, some, some uh, queries. So you do really need to define the job level as well. Um, and you, you need to be, be based on more than just uh, years of experience or even capabilities. You know. A bit of relaxation, chill out. No? OK. <laughs> um, job titles. Right. Job titles are important. Um, again, this is like um, something that Sometimes people miss out as well and say, it's not important. What job titles are, are not important. But actually, they are important. They are important because this is how you're being perceived externally. And this you, is also how you're being perceived internally. Uh, it also affects how you perceive yourself. And it also affects how your family and friends perceive you. Um, one anecdote that I want to talk about is, uh, it's quite interesting because I... I was talking to somebody, right? I, I traveled to Bangalore and I was talking to somebody and was telling me that uh, uh, job titles are important for him because um, that's how he can get married. Because if he doesn't have a good title, then he can't get married because you know, it's not just about the salary, it's also about how he's being perceived. Um, he will not be able to market himself and get himself a, a wife even if he doesn't uh, have a good job title. So that's something that uh, I thought was quite interesting. It's something that I've never really thought about. But um, at the same time, it is, it is important because um, if you go in and you think about, uh, I don't care, everyone is the same and so on and so forth. Yes, to a certain degree, because there's always this thing about uh, self-worth and, and how well your, your, your being is, right? So uh, as a manager, you might really want to think a little bit about this. And as an engineer, if somebody starts to tell you that, look, job titles are not important, Think a little bit about it. Uh, are they really important or not really important? For say Chinese, it's not about uh, going for uh, getting married, for example. During Chinese New Year, would your, your, your relatives ask you, it's like, so what are you now? This year, you're, you're a software engineer. 
10 years later, you're still software engineer. How do you think your relatives will perceive you, right? Uh, again, I'm not saying that this is the most important thing you should be doing, and neither am I saying that um, you should ask for this kind of roles. <laughs> um, I'm just saying that don't consider that as totally unimportant. You know, um, it's kind of funny. You know. Most influential person in China, of China. Okay, um, last bit about uh, organizational, organizational changes. How many of you are football fans? Right, so, you know who this person is, right? You remember what happened after he retired? Right, the, the problems that were faced? Yeah. So organizational changes are critical, they are important. But at the same time, they are also inevitable. Right? Because don't expect the organization that you are in today will not change ever. Right? Because very cliche, the only concern is change. Yeah. Um, there will be change. And as a manager, managing changes is very, very critical. Because organization changes, as they are inevitable, they are also one of the most painful things that can happen in a company. So um, it's a very important part of the job don't trivialize it. As a manager, nothing, nothing beats the human touch. You need to get engaged with your engineers. You need to talk to people. Uh, you need to make sure people understand why there's change and uh, manage the change through, right? So, funny picture, but the reality is, yeah, in, when organization change, you only have one job. Yeah? Don't screw it up, okay? Right, so let's talk about augmentation. Um, augmentation is really about, say, you hire a team now, you have a team of 20 people, but you also have 20 projects, so what do you do? Right. Uh, hire quickly? Probably you can't hire fast enough, so what do you do? Right. There are many ways of actually doing augmentation. Uh, these are some of the things, contracting, body shopping, outsourcing, offshoring, uh, doing remote teams. Oh, by the way, if you, anyone knows what this picture is? This is a medieval German mercenary. Right. Curious facts, you know. Anyway, um, so augmenting your team. Generically, this applies to all the methods you use to augment your team. Right? Um, the pros is not headcount. And for some companies, it is important because um, for some larger companies, sometimes not having hit count is important because hit count affects a lot of other kinds of calculation, right? Uh, whereas having contractors or having people who are not working for you, not full-time engineers, um, matter as well. Uh, also, not employee, and that depends on uh, country and engagement. Not hit count, not employee. And of course, if you really need some people to come in and do some job, it is a quick fix. So definitely these are all the advantages. Um, then there are other advantages as well. But there are also a lot of disadvantages, the cons. It, it can be actually costlier than hiring somebody. Um, of course, if you are not, if you are a mercenary, then you really don't have much loyalty. More importantly, as a person who's managing like uh, the intellectual property of your organization, you don't have the retention of knowledge. If this guy quits, then you lose the, the knowledge. Uh, and managing contractors, managing outsource people are actually quite different from managing uh, employees. So as a, as a manager, as an engineering manager, you need to consider that you have to manage two or more different types or groups of people, right? And you need to change your style accordingly. Right, um, so contracting. Contracting is the simplest because now you directly engage an engineer. So you hire him, basically. Um, this can apply to freelancers, part-timers, consultants, usually time and material basis. Once you get him to kill somebody, you know, that's, that's it, right? Um, no one's laughing, it's so serious. <laughs> um, yeah, the pros, you have direct control of the engagement. Um, normally, it's more loyal to the company and relatively cost-effective. But at the same time, there's a lot of work, right? Because the amount of work that you spend on contracting somebody, why not just hire that guy, right? Just not make him a permanent employee. Um, and there is a risk in being considered as employment. So if you contract, directly contract somebody long enough, when it comes to uh, labor dispute, 
it could be considered as employment and you could run yourself into trouble if you are supposed to be below a certain headcount. Yeah. Um, and finally, of course, if you are directly contracting, means you actually have to recruit as well. So all those things I talked about earlier on about recruiting, this comes through here. You just need to do the same kind of work. So again, again, if you go through all this kind of work, um, to hire a contractor, they want to just hire you as a full-time staff, right? So pros and cons. Um, body shopping, I call it body shopping. Uh, really, you are outsourcing to a, a company uh, to engage a contractor. And nominally, the engineer works for the other company, although he's permanently stationed in your office. So he will be like a contractor, he will be like an employee, except that his paycheck comes from another company. Uh, again, time and material basis. The pros is that you won't have the risk of being considered as employment. Um, you wouldn't have that kind of administrative work because the payroll, leave management and so on is all done by the other company. And of course, this is the, the magic word, right? So if you don't like this guy, he doesn't perform accordingly, he can just go and call up the other company and say, please replace him. And normally, the other company will just replace him. Um, not the best thing to do in the world, but yeah, that's, that's something that can happen. Um, the con is that it's directly, it's actually costlier than a direct co uh, contract. It has to be because you are paying another company to do this. And um, the engineers themselves, the ones who are contractors to you, are normally, I mean, I, I, I've encountered it so many times, right? They are given a lot less than direct contract. Say you pay this contractor, uh, this contracting company $10,000 for a headcount. Um, he could be playing the engineer $3,000 and uh, the overhead will, 7000 will go to the company itself. And this happens and then the terms for employment for the uh, contractor are usually quite, um, quite bad. So like some, I've encountered cases where the employee actually, employee of the outsourced company do not get medical benefits. Right? And if they take leave, then they would actually have salaries deducted and so on and so forth. So it can be a bit abusive over time. And of course, if you're actually working with somebody like that and you see that he's actually like a lot worse off than your other engineers, something, sometimes some, it just doesn't feel right. But it is another option if you want to do body shopping. Um, outsourcing is something that's very common. I think everybody knows about it is. Uh, you engage a company to deliver an entire project. Right? You don't know what this picture is, right? Behind here? Yeah, okay. Some say, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, pros in that you don't need to manage people directly. You're just managing deliverables. Um, liability shift to outsourcing vendors for failed projects. This is probably why a lot of people do this, right? If anything fails, it's the vendor's fault, right? So you're shifting your liability for the delivery of a project to your vendor. Um, again, not the best in the world, but yeah, this is a, a reason why a lot of people do that. And there's always a perception that the vendors, because you know they are big, reputable, um, technology companies, they are able to hire better quality engineers. So this is a real perception, right? So the perception is like, hey, I'm, I'm a company that does fashion. Uh, why would I want to en engage engineers directly? I don't know how to manage engineers. Um, I will not be able to retain them. Why not engage a company who has 10,000 engineers? They know how to manage engineers. Why don't I, I get them to deliver the project for me? So that's always this perception. I, I call it perception because obviously I, I don't believe that's the case. But um, I'm also not saying that that's entirely not true as well. I think it's always a balance, but um, this is not something that you should take as a matter of fact. Yeah. The con is that um, upfront, you often need to give clear specifications, which is not always possible, and it's not definitely not very agile. Um, the other one is, is, this is something where a lot of companies start to realize as well, the engineering capabilities are not available in-house anymore, right? Because you become a company that outsources, a company that just become project managers. Um, you also have risk to your intellectual property because a vendor can develop a competing product or even sell your, they develop something for you and then they sell the same solution to your competitor. Now, of course, there are always like contracts to, to stop this from happening, but uh, you can't really stop whatever goes in your brain, right? I learned all those things, developing a product for you. Uh, I could, 
I mean, even if the company doesn't do that, that person could just work for another another company, right? And it's hard to stop it. Um, and yeah, the kind of uh, resourcing strength for you has changed or will be changed to um, having a team of technology people to a team of project managers. Uh, that's kind of inevitable. So outsourcing, um, let's go on to the next one. Oops, okay. Offshoring, so you are engaging a company to deliver outside the country. It can either be time, it can either be a time and material or per project basis. Because it is in a different country, usually you want to outsource to a lower cost country. Because I've not really heard about outsourcing to a higher cost country, uh, except in some companies, you know, but uh, that's a different story. Um, usually more cost effective, and because it's lower cost, you can probably scale. Um, the con is that, again, you need upfront clear communications. This is very important, the next one, communications risk. It's not about the other team doesn't know how to speak English well or whatever language well, right? Sometimes it's not about language. It's about time zone. You talk to him, it's 5 o'clock, it's, it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning for you, it could be midnight for him, right? or vice versa. Uh, time zone is a real serious problem. I've encountered it very, very often. Um, face to face, it's very different when you have somebody in front of you and you discuss something and uh, somebody over the phone or, or, or Skype or whatever it is. It's, it's actually a completely different thing. And finally, of course, cultural differences. Right? You are, sometimes you could sit, the guy could sit, sit there, smile, you keep nodding, you think that you're okay, done, he understands what I'm saying. Right? He delivers something completely different. Um, yeah, that's hap that happens pretty often. You need to have very strong project management and not very strong project management here. You need to have very strong project management there. Or you need to have somebody very strong located there. So what that means is either you need to pay for something, someone really expensive on the other end, or you need to fly somebody that you trust over there as well. So uh, whatever it is you do, it is expensive. Yeah, uh, because you do need to frequently travel. And uh, finally, the um, remote teams. So this is probably the, something that uh, some companies do, but not as often. You would then build an entire remote team that is part of your organization. These are full-time employees. Um, and they sit outside your main development center. Right? You will sit in the external site. This, this actually happens to both big and small companies, but um, they, they have their own pros and cons. So the pro is that you, keep, you do keep your knowledge internally, so that's, that's good, right? And you are able to scale if they are lower cost countries or, or companies uh, or, or cities. But it is very costly. You need to have a lot of investment, both in terms of money, the kind of work, setting it up because you are literally setting a different company in a different country. Um, and all the communications risks that I talked about earlier on, they are all true as well. Right? So this is actually very true. And um, you need to fly as well. Right? You need to fly a lot. You know, uh, either you need to fly to them or they need to fly to you. Either way, there's a lot of flying around. Mm. Okay, so just want to close up on, on augmentation and really um, on the rest of the presentation. Um, augmentation is not easy. Yeah. Uh, it's really like sea monsters. You see like those ancient maps, sometimes it's like here be sea monsters. Yeah. So the whole augmentation piece is like here be sea monsters, right? Uh, sometimes you step in thinking that it's an easy way out to solve a problem, immediate problem you have, uh, but it is not. So you need to really think carefully about it. There is, there is no silver bullet, there, there is no uh, absolute answer whether um, whatever you're doing is right. Very often you need to experiment, um, but just be aware that if you want to do this, it's, it's not as easy as sometimes it's made out to be. Especially if you talk to, say, outsourcing vendor and they say, it's great, we work well together, we have delivered for these 10 different large companies, successful projects. He just didn't show you the 100 other field projects, right? So um, you just need to be a bit careful about this. So that's my last slide. and. Uh, my contact details if you need to reach out to me. Thank you.
Shaoxiong. Any questions for Shaoxiong? We're open. So you can ask me anything live. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, in terms of, uh, because you manage both startups and corporates, right? Uh, you probably have seen the what I call uh, sequential growth problems where as you grow the company, how do you organize the team or how do you decide what are the roles to fill up over time? Um, I mean, the, the actual answer and the cop-out is really like, it depends. <laughs> Right, because every, I mean, different companies would work differently, right? And um, it, it, you will get different projects as well. And so you need to staff up the team according to projects. So it's, it's actually very subjective. It depends on the kind of team that you're trying to build up. And sometimes it's not just scaling up, it's also scaling down, you know? Because, um, like I said, organizational changes happen all the time. So sometimes organizational change, you lose part, half your portfolio which happened to me a couple of times. And then you need to scale your team down. That's, that's what it is, right? And then uh, you need to scramble to say, look, I lost half my portfolio. I still have my full team. What do I do? Is it layoff time or what? Right? So um, there, are different, there are different answers to it. Sometimes it could be like, OK, I'm going to scramble to look for other work for, for these guys because these are good guys. I want to retain them. Sometimes it's really say, look, actually, uh, I don't see any other growth for for such skills, and it is uh, it's probably a sin for me to try to hang on to them, right? If they have better roles in other organizations, then maybe I should find them better uh, organizations. So scaling up is always I mean, scaling is not always just up. Uh, you need to consider how you can scale down as well. Mm. And sometimes you don't have a choice, right? You're stuck with it, you have a government and uh, you know, uh, commitments that you have to meet, so you have to grow to a certain number, and then you have to you know, play along. Uh, yeah, so those, those are the most dangerous, sorry, I just answer him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sometimes these are the most dangerous, right? Because you have a government commitment, say, hey, hey, you know, EDP gave me X million dollars, uh, but at the same time, they need me to hire 50 people, 50 engineers here. So I've hired 50 engineers, but what do they do? They really have nothing to do because I. Yeah, I'm just fulfilling a government, uh, you know, obligation. That's pretty dangerous because once the EDB money goes away, then there's no need for such jobs, right? As a manager, I mean, as an individual, they feel it's really sucky, right? You are you're a pawn, basically. Yeah, you're being hired because of uh, funding, then you're being fired because there's, there's no funding, and it's like you're being just moved around with chess pieces. As a manager, it's horrible as well because you know now you need to hire and fire people, right? Uh, so. I mean, sometimes getting this kind of things are, are not the best, uh, but you need to play along with it because you have no choice. Right? Uh, then you need to be a bit more creative and maybe finding new projects or new world or develop products. Always try to keep something in your back pocket like this product that you might want to, to actually uh, develop if there are no other work to do. So this team have number one, something to do, something to improve the skills and potentially take this product out and sort of wave it around and say, hey, you know, this team has done a great job. Uh, what else can they do? Right? So some of the things that you can do. Yes. Um, your answer to this might be it depends as well. Uh, but, but from a, a startup perspective, and I guess it's a two-part question, what should a non-tech co-founder be looking for in a tech co-founder? Um, and conversely, what should a tech Co-founder, even for a non-tech co-founder, what makes the ideal partnership there? What are the fundamentals? Okay. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I, I think it depends on how well the individual works together. Is I, I mean, for me, I think the the skills must be complementary. So the. Uh, uh, tech co-founder must be able to do something that the uh, non-tech co-founder can do and vice versa. If you all have the same capabilities, then there's probably a gap somewhere. Right? So you want to actually be complementary. That's the first thing. The second thing is you, you need to work together. Um, you need to be able to work together. Um, and I think the third thing is you should not be too close. Uh, um, I see that. I say that because, I mean, again, this is like, anecdotal, right? I've seen so many like boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, close friends, roommates from, from university 
come out co-founders and then they just you know split apart because of work so that gives me to think about a having a um, co-founder who is really too close sometimes might not be a good thing I'm not necessarily saying that that's that's uh, like the absolute truth but I've seen enough to, to think that there, there, is, there is definitely risk to it because startups usually are pretty risky in the first place right uh, and this is really a strain to the relationship sure Yes. Yes. I just say Avengers assemble and they all come. Once a month, we will join the co-founder and kiss his ring and then he will select us from that process. No, really, I mean, the, um, the serious thing is I um, basically, basically I, I have uh, interesting roles right, to fulfill. I mean, I have doing roles in my, my current organization and most of the time, people just say, hey, you know, why do you join Singapore Power? Why, why are you joining a utilities company, especially a Singapore uh, government-linked company, right? Um, and then I would start talking about it to, to them and talking about the roles. And uh, I would ask, are you interested in joining me? And they would say, I'll think about it. And after a while, they send me the resume and then da da da, it just happens. Yeah. From being uh, keeping my ex boss is we have good relationship with South Yong. And we, we work with him and we know that the things that he's capable of is able to provide us. So there's an implicit trust between him and us. That's why he's able to get a lot of good people. Yeah, he's being too modest. Uh, only South Yong can do this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he says it just happens, but it will only just happen for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You are deliberately, <laughs> you are deliberately embarrassing me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's a certain reputation, but yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's not just anybody saying, "No, you want to assemble a team and then you get it done in two months." You get probably most of the good, uh, very good engineers in, in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's something I'm curious because in the article, you know, you mentioned that there's no KPIs and you're trying to make sure that everybody works together well before you. You set on you decide on the hierarchy, and so how do you decide on how you know you, you position everyone in the team in terms of seniority, in terms of you know uh, structure? Um, again, I'm I'm saying this not because I know it all. Uh, neither am I saying that this is the correct way of doing things. Um, but I'm getting people in first, and uh, I want them to work together. I want them to start working together. And once they start working together, they will realize you know, who has capabilities of doing certain things. And then a natural leader normally forms, right? And that will probably be most likely the, the leader who is going to be leading the team, right? Um, it doesn't often mean that um, the leader is the most senior person or maybe the leader is the most capable person. Uh, it just means that the person is able to lead the team to do, to achieve certain targets. You know? Maybe I should be more specific. Like how do you ensure equity between the team? Because you have different people with different experiences and then yeah. when you try to form the team and get them to work together where yeah. natural leaders will not emerge and people who are followers will also not appear. But there will so, be a difference in the equities, right, in terms of how everybody will perform in the organization. I mean this I mean depends what you mean by equity. I mean it will not be equitable, right? Because somebody will be more experienced, somebody less experienced. So there's no I mean it's not equitable. Uh, what I'm what I try to do is um, try to put a goal forward to say, look, this is what we try to achieve, and uh, whatever it is, this team should be achieving it, right? And people inside that team will try to achieve uh, the goal accordingly. Um, it, I'm hoping that um, as this goes by, there will be a natural leader and something will come up. Of course, I cannot guarantee that, uh, in which case, I'll probably need to figure out who the best leader is and then uh, make that person the leader. So basically, you want to form a self-selecting team leader within the group. That's, That's the best way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then everyone acknowledges that's the leader. One last question for Sasha. Yes. What does it mean, leader for you? Leader is somebody who is able to um, lead. <laughs> and, let, you know. let, me, let me rephrase. So, <coughs> 
So you really know the answer, right? Yeah. yeah. But no, but I wanted to know your opinion. Yeah. So I, I think um, for me, the leader is somebody who's able to deliver results, right? Who's able to governize the team to deliver results. Yeah. So that's, that's it. For me, the leader is able to, somebody who's able to bring the team together and deliver a result. Yeah. So whether it is the first way or the second way, if he can governize the team and he can convince everybody to work with him to deliver the results, the first way or the second way does really matters little. Right? You could either lead from the front or lead from the back or lead in the middle. As long as you are able to bring the team together and deliver the results, then you are the leader. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. I hope you guys found this um, session interesting. So I think. There are a couple of like key components that Sao has talked about. Like first of all, the fundamental thing, hiring, the key questions that you should ask yourself as founders, as like managers, and then talk about organization. How do you organize and form like a squad of Avengers or like suicide squad? That's what I yeah, that's what I think. Nobody and has to die. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's lucky. Yeah. And the last one would be the augmentation, which I found very interesting, like body shopping and yeah and stuff like that. So um, if you guys have any like further questions, yeah, just feel free to like um, hang around and uh, you know connect with each other. And I think to wrap up, I would like to just like uh, introduce like the TIA community. We actually have an online Facebook group that we would welcome everyone to join and be part of it. So it's like we share like discussions and we help each other out. So there's investors, there's like technical people, there's non-technical people. So we try and like um, gather all these like um, like-minded folks online so it will not be people based in Singapore only but like across Asia yeah so um, I will drop you guys a note like after this event and then yeah we'll connect from there thank you guys for coming thank you thank you